The Gospel reading today is Matthew 14, 13 to 27. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by the time the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who's going to pray for the preacher this morning? Keith is. Come on up. Good morning. I'm Keith Sutton. There's a saying by John Ruskin that defines Terry Pastor's divine service. Unless we perform divine service with every willing act of our life, we never perform it at all. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, even though my pastor serves our church with what seems like boundless energy, no one is a superhuman. I know the pastor gets really weary. The man's on the body and the spirit are nearly unending. Would you let my pastor find respite and relaxation from the day? Would you clear the mind, give a good sleep tonight, and refreshment for another day of kingdom service? Bless my pastor, O Lord, for faithfulness and offer blessings with a new day to continue in faithfully service to you. Amen. Thank you. How many of you wondered if it was a mistake when you heard the gospel lesson this morning? Because we read it last Sunday, didn't we? How many of you remembered that we read it last Sunday? Barry did, because he did the PowerPoint and said, yes, one that I don't have to redo. Now, I told you last week, when Jesus heard this, when he heard what news? Do you remember that? There's your Bible quiz du jour. When Jesus heard what news that made him need to go off and pray by himself? He'd heard the news that his cousin John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. And it broke his heart, and he needed to go off and pray with God. But what happens when you need to go off and pray with God? Somebody needs you. Have you ever had a child in your life? Have you ever tried to go to the bathroom? Have you ever had somebody knocking on the door going, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, I need you, I need you, I need you. In my house, it's not Mom and Dad. It's Terry, where are you? Terry, my mother will call me sometimes on the phone when I'm in the bathroom from her room. Yes, she's listening. Hey, Mom. 
but it's hard to find time by yourself, isn't it? But how many of you say, I would just, I'd read the Bible more if I could find the time. It's like saying, this is the, what I hear in premarital counseling, not premarital counseling, marital counseling, when people are having trouble. And they'll say, I, we'd spend more time together if we could find the time. And I think if you don't learn to make time, you're never going to find time. How many of you find time when you look for it? You can't find it because it's not there, but if you make time, it will be there. So Jesus made time for God, and he goes up and he prays, and then suddenly there's this crowd. Now, they're talking about Lake Gennesaret, which we call the Sea of Galilee, which is only 13 miles from end to end. So they walked around. They're tired. He heals them. He has compassion on them, which draws him away from the time that he spent with his father into service once more. And then they're hungry, and we said last week, the problem with them being hungry and the disciples saying, send them away to get something to eat, there was no place to buy that much food. And if there had been a place to buy that much food, they didn't have any money. So yet again, Jesus feeds them out of his compassion. And then what does he do? He makes the disciples get in a boat, and they go to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowd, and after he had dismissed the crowd, what does he do? He goes up the mountain by himself to pray, to pray, off by himself to pray. That's what made me choose the second lesson today. Actually, the first lesson from Genesis. Who is it that we're talking about here? It says, the same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, crossed the fort of the Jabbok. Who are we talking about there? Jacob. What do you know about Jacob? Here's your second Bible quiz du jour. What do you know about Jacob? Fine upstanding guy wasn't Jacob. No. He was the trickster, the huckster the usurper, the one who, when his brother was in the womb with him, they were twins, remember? The mother said it was like they were having a fight, they were wrestling inside the womb. And one is born first. Who was born first, Jacob or Esau? Esau, that's right. He was hanging on his heel trying to pull him back in and say, nope, me first, me first, me first, Jacob. And then Jacob grows up, Esau grows up, Esau's a hunter, he's a big hairy guy, real burly, manly man. He's out in the field hunting and doing his thing, and he comes in. And what does his brother do with their mother's help? Cheats his brother out of his birthright. Remember that story? He sells, Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of beans, a bowl of lentils, basically. So we can't really blame Jacob for doing that as much as we can, right? But his mother was in there with him. Now, the mother, that was an interesting thing too, wasn't it? When you look at the wives and all that was going on with them, Jacob gets tricked and swindled by his own father-in-law, Laban, because he wants to marry one daughter and he sneaks the other one in. People say to me all the time, how did he not know who he was marrying? We're talking the day before electricity. We're talking being in a tent at night with a veil on that he saw her eyes. That's all he saw if he could see them. It wasn't until the morning comes and he goes, oh, I married the wrong girl. Then he has to work seven more years so he can marry the one that he loves. And Finally, he's out there with his herds, his flocks, his big old group of people. He's a wealthy man, but he hears, uh-oh, who's coming from the other direction? His brother Esau, the one he tricked, the one he swindled, the one he cheated, the one who was so angry that he wanted to kill his brother. And so he's there. He sends people across the river, and then he hears his brother's coming toward him with 400 men. If your brother's man and he's coming at you with 400 men, what do you think is going to happen? You think he's going to throw you a party? You think he's having a cake downstairs? I don't think so. And he's scared. For the first time in Jacob's life, he has come face to face with what he has done to other people, and it's got him terrified. So what does he do? He goes out into the wilderness by himself, and he has a wrestling match, and it ends up he's wrestling with God. I don't know about you, I've wrestled with God a few times in my life. Maybe that's why I'm limping right now, you never know. Because how do we know it was God he was wrestling with? For one thing, Jacob won't let him go until he gives him a blessing. So he gives him a blessing and then he says, what's your name? Now to have someone's name in this part of the ancient world meant to have power over them. And we cannot know God's name, we can't speak it, it's too holy. But Jacob's given a new name, Israel. And his 12 sons that he will eventually have will become the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Jacob does me a lot of good in scripture because he was such a rotten rat. He really was. He didn't live according to God's will, did he? He did everything wrong, everything backwards, everything he could do to cheat somebody else. And yet God is faithful because God had made a promise. God's promises are secure and good and worthy to be trusted. And so here he is wrestling with God. We know it's God because he says, I've seen God face to face and I've prevailed because there was a thought in the ancient world, if you saw God ever face to face, you were going to just be consumed. Like Moses, remember Moses goes up the mountain, sees God, and then his face is sort of weird, shiny, strange. He has to put a veil on from then on because people are like, what happened to you? But Jacob survives and he goes on to become Israel. Now Jesus does not have this sort of thing on him. He's never cheated anyone, never tricked anybody, but he knows that to do his work, he needs to spend time with his God alone by himself with God. When's the last time? I want to ask you to ask yourself, do a little self-inventory right now. When's the last time you spent time by yourself with God, conscious of God's presence? I mean, wherever you are, God is there. You know that. But conscious of God's presence, seeking God's will for your life, seeking God's wisdom, seeking God's power in your life. When's the last time you made time for that? Because if you're not making time for that, you're going to be in trouble. Which brings me to the song we sang this morning. It was, it was an interesting day yesterday, full of God moments and... John McGuckin sent me a text message with a link to the story of the song, which I had already looked at, which is why I asked you all to do the song this weekend. So there was a little full circle there. The song that they sang, Jesus, I am resting, resting. How many of you remember that old hymn? It's an old one, old, 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 written, not in the last century, the century before that, 18th, no, 19th century, late 19th century hymn written by a woman named Jean Sophia Piggott, who was born in 1842. 1842, she was born. She wrote the song. She only lived to be 37 years old. But the song moved so many people, including her brother, who had been moved to go to China by the work of a missionary that he had heard of named Hudson Taylor. Now, her brother William Piggott was so completely enthralled by the work that he'd heard that Hudson Taylor had done in China that all he talked about was China. This is what someone wrote about him, a friend of his from college. If ever a man lived who was utterly in earnest, it was William, it was Thomas Wesley Piggott. Whenever he returned to this country from his chosen field of labor, his flowing speech in private and public was always and only of China and her people, whom he loved so much. It was impossible to remain indifferent or unsympathetic in the presence of such zeal. It was such a reality that to spend time to spend his time and strength, his mental and physical abilities, and his money freely and wholly in the cause of China was to him the most natural, for him the only reasonable and possible way to live. He loved the people of China. He felt called to be there, to be a missionary to them, following in the footsteps of Hudson Taylor. Well, he apparently met Hudson Taylor and introduced him to his sister's hymn, Jesus, I Am Resting, Resting, which Hudson Taylor adopted as his own credo, almost. This was his song. Do you all have a song like that that you turn to? A hymn, perhaps, when things are rough in your life? Like, it is well with my soul is one of mine that I go to again and again and again. Well, Hudson Taylor was heard to whistle this song, to sing it under his breath all the time. When he heard about the missionaries who had been murdered in the Boxer Rebellion, he started whistling the hymn, and someone said, don't you think it's rather rude to whistle at this moment? This is what he said. Would you have me be anxious and troubled? That would not help them and would certainly incapacitate me for my work. I just have to roll the burden on to the Lord. He didn't know then. I don't think that the missionaries who were killed included William Piggott, the brother of the woman who wrote the hymn. He, his wife, and his children were executed publicly. They were beheaded in China during the Boxer Rebellion when they were trying to expel these Westerners and their Western religion out of their country once and for all. And we know that there are still devout Christians in China now because of the work of people like Hudson Taylor and William Piggott, or Thomas Piggott, excuse me. She died at 37, did not know that her brother would go on to be a missionary, did not know that he would be killed as a missionary. 
but she wrote the song. I didn't hear the words very clearly. Let me read them to you again. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee as thy beauty fills my soul, for by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole. Oh, how great thy loving kindness, vaster, broader than the sea. Oh, how marvelous thy goodness lavished all on me. Yes, I rest in thee, beloved. Know the wealth of grace is thine. Know thy certainty of promise and have made it mine. Simply trusting thee, Lord Jesus, I behold thee as thou art, and thy love, so pure, so changeless, satisfies my heart, satisfies my deepest longings, meat supplies my every need, and passeth me around with blessings. Thine is love indeed. Ever lift thy face upon me as I work and wait for thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. Brightness of my Father's glory, sunshine of my Father's face, keep me ever trusting, resting, fill me with thy grace. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. We have to find time to spend alone with Jesus Christ, with God our maker. We have to make time for God if we want to remain sane in this world, if we want to be, if we want to be fruitful in this world, because you cannot give water from an empty well. You need to refill that fullness of God in your life. So this week, I hope you'll look at our website and our Facebook page. It has all these great practices to try every day. One's going to be really hard for some folks. It's called to practice silence. Because how can you possibly listen when you're talking? It's another thing I learned in marriage counseling. If one person is just talking and the other one is just getting ready to give them their snappy comeback, you're never going to listen to each other. But in order to hear God's voice, sometimes we have to quiet our own and listen. So my prayer for you this week is that you will find time. Know that you'll make time for the Lord. You'll make time. You'll carve out an hour, a day if you can, or even an hour in the week, and spend listening for God to speak to you. You might be surprised at what you hear, but you will hear an answer. I can promise you that. And find the song that your heart can sing when it's troubled. Maybe it's Jesus, I am resting, resting, or maybe it's the one we're about to sing. We're going to sing a modern one now. Um, you are mine, and then we're going to end with breathe. This is the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. So now I'm going to ask you to just stand and join in singing, You are mine, number 2218 in the faith we sing. <laughs> 